Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. I, I really didn't uh, expect to see anyone here today. I, I do realize that uh, it's uh, a Mother's Day or whatever. We don't have uh, anything like that in Britain. I, I, I mean, I, I'm not aware of. And uh, I do realize that I, uh, you must be all orphans. And, uh, <laughs> It must be my uh, new market. <laughs> you know, when I think about it, orphans for Palestine, it sounds to me as peculiar as Jews voice for peace. <laughs> you know. And now, it's, 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 you know, restrained. You're, you don't find it that funny, but you will find it funny in a second. In order to elaborate or to understand the duplicious the deceptive nature of the contemporary Palestinian solidarity discourse, I'm going to use a very new tactics. It's the, in fact the first time that I'm doing it. I did it um, two weeks, three weeks ago in Norway, and it worked. I did it two days ago in Denver, and this is basically what I'm going to do in the States uh, in the next two weeks. I basically invented a few fictional characters, quite simple characters. You will be able to understand who they are, where they come from, what they believe in, and we will try to examine how our terminology, Palestinian solidarity terminology, applies to them. The first character is called Nabil. Nabil is 25 years old, Palestinian refugee. He lives in Sabra and Shatila, third generation refugee. No education, no money, no work. He cannot travel. I'm a touring musician, I've been in a lot of places. There is nothing more devastating than Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria. It's beyond belief. We are going to talk to Nabil, and we are going to ask him, Nabil, what do you think about the end of the occupation? And of the occupation, this is a, a fundamental demand that the Palestinian solidarity is pushing forward. And he will tell you immediately, it's, a, it's very important, but it has nothing to do with me. I'm not living under occupation. We talk to him about colonialism. He doesn't know what it means. We talk to him about settler colonialism, he still doesn't know what it means. Apartheid, apartheid he understands. He said, listen, with all due respect, I'm actually oppressed by an Arab country. I'm not living in apartheid Israel. We talk to him about BDS, I don't have any issues with BDS. We really, in Sabra and Shatila, we don't sell uh, Israeli products. <laughs> Quite shocking. Here, I went through pretty much the entire Palestinian solidarity terminology, as you all know it, and it means nothing to Nabil. Quite shocking. But then, we push it one step farther. We bring out a nostalgic term, the right of return. 
for sure we understand it. It is from Safed, from northern Palestine. It doesn't necessarily want to come back. But the right of return addresses its situation. He is there, a refugee, because he cannot return to his land. He is happy, whatever, he will take everything that m would address his misery, his plight, even citizenship. They're not even citizen in Lebanon after how many years? After 60 years? Interesting. Let's take another fictional Palestinian. His name is Yusuf. Yusuf lived in Gaza. He's 70 years old. When he was two years old, he had to leave his country. He was born in Beersheba. He ended up in Gaza all his life. He believed that he'll come back to Beersheba. It didn't happen. He doesn't believe anymore. Unlike Nabil, Yusuf is actually very educated. We do the same exercise. Yusuf, Sabah al Hayr, Sabah al Nur, we do all the na na na, and we start to talk. What was our first term? End of occupation. He tells you, this is probably very good, but I'm not living under occupation. I'm living in an open air prison. It doesn't apply to Yusuf. We talk to him about colonialism. Yusuf is an uh, educated boy. Man, he's 70 years old. He actually tells you, you know, as far as I'm aware, when Palestine was subject of British Empire, our situation as Palestinians was actually better. It's not colonialism now. Settler colonialism, the same nonsense. BDS, it tells you, actually, I like hummus made in Israel in tins. Am I right? Munir. Quite a few Palestinians like uh, Israeli hummus. I work hard. I work hard. Huh? I work hard. <laughs> no, but the thing is that the people in Gaza, they are in siege. They actually need some of the Israeli goods. Apartheid? No, it's not apartheid. He is living in a prison. It's not apartheid. We talk to him about the right of return. Everything is resolved. He says, yes, this is what I am all about. The right of return. So we just elaborated on the cases of one Palestinian refugee. There are around 5 million Palestinian refugees in the world. The Palestinian cause is the Palestinian refugees. We spoke with Yusuf. There are 1.5 million Palestinians in Gaza. None of our terminology applies to them. But check it out. Here is another character. His name is Yona. He is my father. He's 76 years old. He's a nice guy. He's not very militant. He believes in peace, actually. Let's talk to my father. And he's not even Palestinian solidarity uh, campaigner or anything. Let's talk with my father about Palestinian solidarity terminology. We talk to my father. We ask him, what do you think about the end of the occupation? My father says, immediately, I don't like to control another people. You come to my father and tell him, Yona, what do you think about colonialism? My father will tell you on the spot. Just tell me who is my mother state and to take me out of here, I am leaving tomorrow. Like most Israelis, most Israelis, you give them, they, they, they did the kind of, two, they made a poll in Israel. 75% of the Israelis, you give them green card, $4,000 and they're out. 
You know, so basically we can solve this Palestinian-Israeli Palestinian conflict in it's a matter of few green cards. <laughs> By the way, it's not fair on you. On Americans. Or anyone else. We talked to my father about apartheid. He says, yes. The way the Palestinians are treated is horrendous. I don't want to be part of it. You talk to my father about BDS. He would support BDS, like a lot of Israelis. He hates the settlers. He has to be identified with them. They are religious, he is not, and all this nonsense. This is quite shocking. Because we just noticed that not a single term that is used within our contemporary pro-Palestinian discourse applies to any Palestinian, but they all, to, they all appeal to my father. How did it happen? I think that we know how it happened. It's called Jewish domination. This, this movement is occupied. And it is far less tolerant than the Jewish state. Because in the Jewish state, the third biggest party is an Arab party in the Knesset. How many goyim sit in the board of Jews' voice for peace? We'll, we'll deal with it. We're still with my father. Then we come to my father with the six million dollar question. The six million is a very significant number in Jewish culture. <laughs> because of St Steve Austin. Remember Steve Austin? You're too young. Steve Austin was the six million dollar man. Yeah, you remember, huh? He was a Jew. <laughs> the bionic Jew. <laughs> anyway, we come to my father and tell him, right of return, yes or no? No. No, 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 no! <laughs> After this two, the old spiel, the Asbara spiel starts. Being in the, the two or thousand years in the diaspora, and now we come back, and now we build, and now look what we have, and they want to take it from us now! It's not going to work. Let's try to understand how we end up, we ended up with a Palestinian solidarity movement that appeals to my father, and this is totally 100% dismissal of all Palestinians. Two thousand one, two thousand two, two thousand three, the Zionists started to realize that Palestine or Palestinian solidarity is becoming an issue. And why? It's very easy to explain. Ask yourself, most of you are not Palestinians. Why should you support Palestine? Is Palestine the most miserable place on the planet? It's miserable. The situation in Gaza, the situation in, in the refugee camps, Yarmouk. But Palestinians are not the most miserable people on this planet. Malnutrition in Africa, the situation in Syria, and in Iraq, and we still moved by the story of Palestine. And why? It is decades of ongoing injustice with no prospect of resolution. But there is one more thing. Palestine was a kosher outlet for us to, to express our dismay, our anger with Jewish power, with Jewish power in banking, with what they are doing in Wall Street, with what they are doing with neoconservatives invading countries, overrepresented in finance, in media, and so on, and so on, and so on. Some Palestinians have problem with me saying it. But this was the driving force 
of this solidarity movement becoming a mass movement. Israelis, Zionists, Jewish activists started to realize in 2001, 2003, that there is a problem. Zionism becomes a Jewish issue. They would say Zionism is anti-Semitism. I don't like the notion of anti-Semitism. I won't mention it. But they were partially correct. It's quite hard to believe, but Zionists sometimes manage to tell the truth. <laughs> against their nature, but they do it. <laughs> From that moment in history, we see a growing involvement of Jews in the Palestinian Solidarity Movement. And you can be anti-Jewish or anti-Israel, anti but one thing you have to admit, when they decide to take a project, they do it well. It took them four or five years to become the dominant force in this movement. JVP is the most dominant campaign, pro-Palestinian campaign, in the world and definitely in America. Mondo Weiss is the most popular pro-Palestinian outlet. Quite shocking. But it is. And by the way, both JVP and Mondo Weiss doing some they are doing some good stuff. But this domination, established domination, comes with a heavy price. And this is what I'm going to deal with in the next 20 minutes. I'm going to produce a conclusive evidence. I think that it's beyond doubt that this Jewish domination has led to a completely corrosive, corrosive, dysfunctional exchange. And as we know, the Solidarity Movement <coughs> contributed very little to the situation in Palestine. The right of return. When I realized that I was complicit in a sin 20 years ago, 25 or 30 years ago, when I was a soldier, I started to realize that something was wrong when I started to see all these Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, and I started to learn what happened, and I realized that it was an issue. The most obvious slogan that appealed to me was the Palestinian right of return. It was very clear to me that if the Jews are allowed to come to a place after 2,000 years and say, listen, you have to move, I've been here before. I had been here before, you know, and, and, and you move. Surely a Palestinian who lived on the land for hundreds of years is allowed to come back. The right of return presented Gaza within the context of history, within the context of the Nakba, of the expulsion of the Palestinians. The right of return clarified why we have five million Palestinian refugees. This is the, co the, the Palestinian cause. This is the Palestinian plight. This is the core. There is no doubt about it. But the Jews, don't like it. The Zionists cannot even utter this concept. And the Jews in the left are determined to wipe this notion out. How did they do it? They saturated our discourse with faulty terminology. End of occupation. Talking about end of occupation was the first sign that something is going astray. What is end of occupation? End of occupation is legitimization of the Jewish state. The end of occupation means, end of occupation means that 
the Jewish state has the right <coughs> to exist within the pre-1967 borders. Ladies and gentlemen, most refugees are refugees from these areas. Now it sounds great, end of occupation. It's not a bad idea to end the, the occupation, but it is spitting in the face of the Palestinian refugees who are the vast majority of Palestinians. Munir, you are a refugee, am I right? Are there any more Palestinians in the room? Also refugee? Most Palestinians whom you come across, unless they are from West Bank, or from those who were indigenous to Gaza, they are refugees. Oh, the Israeli Palestinian, which is very small. I'm, I will deal with all of those. End of occupation was there to divert the attention from the right of return to create an imaginary solution that is really diverting the attention from the real issue. Let's take it further. Colonialism. All our Jewish scholars in this movement and some unsophisticated Palestinians talk about colonialism. Israel and Zionism are not colonialism. It has never been colonialism. Colonialism is a clear exchange between a mother state and a settler state. Israel is a, set, is a settler state, big time. But where is mommy? Today! Today is, is a mother's day! Do you see Israel in the room? No! Because there is no mother. It's a surrogate. America, they can help us, the Brits, oh yeah. There is no mother. It's nonsense. Why we call Israel colonialism? Because the Jews in the movement feel satisfied with it because it suggests that Israel is not a unique disaster. It is bad as England and Dutch and German and Italian. No! Zionism is a unique concept. We don't have any precedent of, in history of people coming to a place 2,000 years and uh, you have to move. No! No! And if you want to understand Zionism in Israel, rather than lying and zigzagging around it, call a spade a spade. It's not Zionism. When Miko Pellet, with all due respect to Miko Pellet, and Blumenthal, less respect to Blumenthal, <laughs> and Pape, no. Then when they talk about colonialism, they are either misleading, consciously, or manifesting a unique form of ignorance. Which is fine. I, I sometimes talk rubbish because I, uh, not today. Today I prepared, uh, <laughs> today I'm um, spot on. I start to talk about it, they realize that they have a problem, which is good. So they invented another lie. The contemporary lie is called settler colonialism. Wow, settler colonialism, never heard about it. I decided to read, what is settler colonialism? It's, in, in, in philosophy of science, you call it head hoc. You invent something that kind of helps you to, to manipulate the facts for another uh, decade, which is exactly what we do, you know, because we have nothing to do. So, so, oh, don't worry. It's like, what is settler colonialism? Settler colonialism suggests that a superpower A mobilize an ethnic minority B into land C on the expense of indigenous population D, which is the Palestinians. This is not the case of Zionism. In the case of Zionism, is ethnic minority B manipulate a superpower A, in this case the Brits, to give them land C that is still in the hands of the Turks on the expense of the Palestinians. So if settler colonialism is A, B, C, D, Zionism in Israel is B, A, C, D. 
All right? Settler colonialism is a lie. Why do they need settler colonialism? Because they like colonialism. Because even settler colonialism, there is no such a thing. It's not a really a genuine historical pattern. Apartheid. What a beautiful lie. Israel is not apartheid. Apartheid, as you know in America, is a racist system of exploitation. But Israel doesn't want to exploit the Palestinians. It wants them out. Israel is an ethnic cleanser driven by an Hitlerian philosophy of Lebensraum, living space. But the Jews in the movement, they don't like it when we compare Israel with Hitler. So it's like, oh, it's, 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 it's as bad as it's, oh, yeah, yeah, it's as bad as uh, South Africa. Why? It's the same story of colonialism. Because if there is apartheid or colonialism, we are entitled to believe or to hope that at a certain stage we will have a post-colonial or a post-apartheid. There is kind of an imaginary notion of resolution. But if it's not colonialism or apartheid, and it's not, we don't have any concept of resolution. We just have in this solidarity industry that is taking money from Soros and going around and achieving nothing. And this is where we are. BDS. We like BDS. A lot of people are uniquely angry with me because I exposed our problematic BDSs. Now, I'm not against BDS. I actually believe that sanctions is the most powerful tool if you want to destroy a country. Sometimes it doesn't work, like in Iran, they put sanctions, they learn how to make um, submarines, tanks, and everything. Sometimes it doesn't work. But nobody speaks about, in the BDS, about sanctions. When the BDS was formed, it did, in 2005, it presented very strong goals. The first goal, 2005, ending its occupation and colonization of all Arab land and dismantling the world. Now, this is as strong demand as it can be. This is BDS in 2005. Because the entirety of Israel, the world of Israel, is occupied Arab land. This was delegitimization of the Jewish state. This is BDS, 100%. But in 2010, something happened. We don't know what happened because there is no protocol where the change, where the change took place. I know who changed it. It was only changed in English, not in any other language, not in Arabic. A very significant change, change sorry, was planted in the BDS first goal. And I read it to you. Ending its occupation and colonization of all Arab lands occupied in 1967. Nice. Oi, 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 how did it happen to us? How? How? A Palestinian, supposedly grassroots organization, compromising on the most precious Palestinian principle, behind the back, of the entire Palestinian people. They even, they do it in a clandestine manner. They don't translate it into English. When they're asked about it, when Barghouti or Ali Abunima asked about it in public, 
They zigzag around and evade answering, avoid answering. Interesting. It is very, very interesting. I started to look into it. It was very clear to me. I have the evidence. And this paper will be on the net very soon, so you can, you'll be able to check it out for yourself. <sighs> that between 2005 to 2010, we see more and more Jews dominating the BDS movement. I, have also, I also possess evidence of George Soros contributing indirectly, at least this is the, the, the evidence that I managed to gather, to BDS. In case you don't know who is George Soros, George Soros is one of the, most, the richest people in the world. He's a liberal Zionist who is invested in Israel and in the West Bank. In the West Bank. I think that it was even invested in Soda Stream. <laughs> it's hilarious. And the outcome is that even the BDS, that was potentially the most powerful tool, has become a Zionist vehicle. The next question. How did it happen to us? How did it happen to us that such a powerful solidarity movement has become a solidarity with the oppressor rather than solidarity with the, with the I started to so talk speak Yiddish sometimes. <laughs> rather than solidarity with the victims, with Yusuf and Nabil and Ahmed, we are in solidarity with Yona, with my dad. We built a discourse that fits the Jews. It's very easy to explain. If you look at the entire terminology that we are using now, end of occupation, colonialism, apartheid, BDS, it refers solely to the situation in the West Bank. That's what it is. And why? Because this is the only thing that concerns the Jews. The West Bank, the Jews don't want to go to uh, uh, Gaza. They, they have nothing to do with Gaza. So now, now maybe to change their mind because there is Gaza. But I already read today in the LA Hebrew paper, the UF2, they both talk about the, the prices of the gas dropping, so we don't need gas. It's un unbelievable. In LA, in the Israeli paper, I in Munira, we collected it yesterday in a, in a Lebanese restaurant. <laughs> it's unbelievable. All right? So the Jews in LA, they say, okay, do we need gas? We don't need gas. The price is going down. We, we, we don't need. The entire Palestinian solidarity discourse is completely dismissal of all Palestinians around the world, of the rights of Munir, of the rights of Yusuf. Nabil, it, only concern, it is only concerned with the situation in the West Bank because this is a reflection of an internal Jewish debate. A lot of Jews believe in greater Eretz Israel, in the big Jewish state from the river to the sea. And very few Jews, very few, if you may want to make know exactly how much, it's something like 0.08% of the Jews. It's very little. Believe that maybe Tel Aviv is Jewish enough and we don't need more than that. But the solidarity movement is supposed to be primarily concerned with the Palestinians and their plight, not with the 0.08% of the Jews. Would you believe that if a bunch of Afrikaners would come to Nelson Mandela 
and tell him, Oi, listen to us, we know, we'll tell you. And they said, they said Don't say Africanus, say, yeah. He will take their advice. Not a million years. Do you think that if Malcolm X is confronted with a bunch of Ku Klux Klan, recovered, they don't believe it anymore, <laughs> they say, Oi, Malcolm, Oi, listen. <laughs> <laughs> but, in the Palestinian Solidarity Movement, we were trapped into it. And why? Because we are progressive, we are liberal, we are good people. And there is one thing that we don't, we are afraid to do, is to confront Jews. Now, what I did, because I realized that we are getting older, and uh, slow, I thought that I should write a book with really not a lot of words, <coughs> big letters, and, I, and even kind of uh, pictures, you see? So you can understand yourself what is going on. There are a lot of pictures. You know, so I basically created a lexicon you know, trying to help you to understand the, the situation. So, uh, I don't know, when it comes to, to A, this is basically the Israeli lexicon. Adolf, not a common name for a newborn baby in Europe these days. It's all from Israeli perspective. Yasser Arafat didn't react well to Polonium 210. Not nice. Anti-Semites. Anti-Semite, brutally honest people, often of Jewish origin. Arabs, particularly unpleasant species of going who were invented to push us into the sea. And uh, uh, Auschwitz, currently a us usually popular tourist destination. No, but it goes also under the belt. Bar Mitzvah, for instance. You see, it's a bar, you know, you can go to Bar Mitzvah. Bar Mitzvah is the moment when the male Jew accepts that his foreskin is not going to grow back. <laughs> you know, so I think, I think that it is very important. You want me to talk about BDS? No, I talk about ben, then you won't buy the book. Canaan, uh, the land of milking money. <laughs> Catch-22, free arm. <laughs> this is funny, free arm. It's hilarious. Anyway. Why I did it? Why I came up with such a hilarious book? And you're all supposed to buy it. It's real, you realize that it was part of, this was a commercial. I was a Jew for 30 years, okay? <laughs> because, how many people here speak Hebrew? Munir. <laughs> but, because you are, uh, you are, you are Palestinian, you are ideal, you have to walk together. You are Palestinian, you speak Hebrew, you are a refugee, you are in the whole, con the whole conflict. <laughs> the word, the word for, the Hebrew word for circumcision, the re religious, is Brit Milah. Have you heard the word Brit Milah before anyone? This is when they chop the nah, nah. You know why they do Brit Milah? Because it's from the book. I, I, it's not my, because uh, Jewish women won't take it unless it's 15% off. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, really. It's, it's basically. That's <laughs> I go below the belt, you know. I actually, I actually rise above, you know. Why, what is Brit Mila? Brit Mila, Brit is covenant, Mila is the word. Covenant with the word. Jewish identity politics, the manipulation, there are very few people. The wisdom is the ability to transform the world 
through the world. It took you going good 2,500 years of Western civilization to understand that this is postmodernism. Jews are doing postmodernism since day one. Brit Mila. It's not just Israel. Bolshevism. Political correctness. Who introduced it? What is political correctness? This is the concept. We tell you what to say, what not to say. Don't, 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 don't say. What do you mean don't say? It's a, we have First Amendment in this country. You don't say. What is political correctness? Political correctness is politics that doesn't allow political criticism. This is the definition of dictatorship. Political correctness is far worse than dictatorship. In the case of dictatorship, you are suppressed by an external entity, a regime, an institution, a tyrant, a dictator. In political correctness, it is yourself. It's self-suppression. In the beginning, you feel kind of some, you shouldn't say it, and next thing, you don't even think it. We turned you into a bunch of zombies. How? We dominate your vocabulary, we dominate your words, your words. This is the most devastating aspect of Jewish power. Look, I'm talking like a Jew. <laughs> yeah. This is the most devastating aspect of Jewish power. Because what is the definition of Jewish power? Jewish power is the ability to stop you talking about Jewish power. <laughs> Jewish power is not maintained by Dershowitz or Abel e. Foxman in the ADL. It is maintained by Democracy Now, yes. <laughs> with, whom I call Democracy Later, actually. <laughs> <laughs> by Paul Jay and the real Jews, real news, who also tells what to say and what not to say. By Noam Chomsky, who was the first, who was the first to attack, to criticize or whatever. In this George Soros funded democracy now, the book on the Jewish lobby, the Israeli lobby, by um, Mayor Scheinman Walt and so on, and so on. Who are the people who try to stop me? Is it the Zionists? Is it Dershowitz? I'm begging for the, now he's a, he's a kind of suspected pedophile, so he cannot help me. But, <laughs> you know, but, but, but Dershowitz, no, I, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm implicated, you know, I'm sorry. No, I, they are very energetic, libidinally, these people. <laughs> you know, but, but, but uh, good for them. You know, and, 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 and so I'm, I'm very suppressed libidinally, you know. Uh, no, it was JPP who tried to stop me in Denver. It was JPP, apparently, who tried to stop me in, in, tomorrow in San Diego. Why? Because I call a spade a spade. Final word. I'm not an activist. Never believed in activism. Don't believe in people in 20, people going around in, with placards. I went once to a demonstration against the war in Iraq. There were four million people in the street. It was amazing. Six o'clock, the demonstration was over. We, we, I went to a Japanese restaurant, you know. Every, and three days later, there was a war in Iraq. <laughs> it is completely insignificant. The whole idea of activism is to channel your dissent or inconvenience into a form of a orchestrated resistance, and it has zero significance. <laughs> there is one thing, there is one thing they cannot cope with.
people, individuals, you and me, starting to say what we think. You here in America have the most powerful tool embedded in your constitution. This is the First Amendment. Start to say what you think. If you think that I'm wrong, you say it. I'm sure that you would. If you think that the Jew is wrong, you are also entitled to say it. You must. You must. Because without you noticing what is going on, I think that I presented you with a very, very conclusive argument that they uprooted you out of your belief, out of the solidarity campaign that you believed in. And this must change, not just because of Palestine. Palestine is far. Baltimore is closer. In the world we are living today, we are all Palestinians. And the policing methods that are used here and in Brazil and in France are made in Israel. Yes. Because this is one of the biggest industry, industries in Israel. Although they do a lot of, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, organ trafficking is also very big in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> Not just military industry. Blood Diamond also very strong. Sorry, sorry, you have to be accurate. All right? We have to be brave enough. And by the way, you have to be brave. I'm brave. My biggest fear is when they come to take me, yes. rather than the, you know, <laughs> it will be so fucking amazing with the camera. It will be awful. You know? So I think if you come, if you want to come, you take the camera first. <laughs> and I run away. <laughs> you know? Anyway, I cannot run very fast anymore. But um, <laughs> anyway, I think, I think that um, this is the message. Start to speak your mind, and you will find out, you will find out immediately how great the impact is. Very simple. And by the book, because this will help you to, to go through this process of speaking your mind. Thank you so much. Yeah, questions? Yeah, um, you brought it up uh, just right now regarding uh, the police state here and, uh, you know, the Jewish control of, you know, that. And what do you think it's going to, where do you think this is going to go? <laughs> One thing I don't do is a charge for prophecy. And I'm not a prophet. I think that it is in our hands. As long as we keep quiet and we channel our opposition into this moronic progressive uh, activism and demonstrate it's they don't care about it. You can watch it's on the net. I a few months ago it, it's a book that is about to come out uh, probably within a year. I just don't want to publish too many books together. Um, I talk about American society, Western society being divided by a cognitive partition. Because we don't produce anything in the West. We don't have any, we don't witness any need for people with lower ability. There is only demand for people who are uniquely clever, not just in terms of IQ. If you can, if you can write an incredible song, you may be okay. If you can rap, 
if you can run some numbers in the stock exchange, you're okay. But if you're just strong physically, there is no factory that needs you. The situation is very devastating because more and more people in America and in the West are becoming what we call underclass. They live in poverty. They cannot consume. People who are underclass or people who cannot participate in this consumption game. This leads to a even deeper and more dangerous Jewish elite domination. Because Jews, Jewish society was divided cognitively for hundreds of years. So within our elite, we have Jewish, Jews overrepresented, and these Jews are culturally and intellectually fit to this game of cognitive partitioning. Is it clear what I'm talking about now, or is it completely abstract? Because usually it takes me one hour and a half to explain this, how it works, and I try to make it very simple. It's not very simple, which means that we, the most of people, most of, most of us, are left behind. What we see in the last few days in Europe, in Britain, we see it in France, and we probably will see it in America, is rise of nationalism and patriotism. What happened in Britain? The labor party was wiped out because the Scots had enough. Enough of what? In the last 50 years, the Jews, the Jewish left intellectuals taught us about to think in terms of identity politics. While 40, 50 years ago, you were all Americans, now we taught you to talk as a, as a black, as a Jew, as a lesbian, as a, as a woman, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a. We took their society and we sliced it. Instead of being one people, which is the old, beautiful left idea, you are engaging in idiotic sectarian wars. Gay marriage, no gay, who gives <laughs> gay marriage? Is it my problem? Why do I have to take an opinion of nothing that uh, I'm aware of the... <laughs> no, it's none of my business. Muslims again. And why? We start to talk as a, as a, as a, and the Scot said, we don't want to talk as Scots, we want to be Scots. By the way, who were the first people to understand that something is uniquely stinky in identity politics? The Zionists. They told the Jews, are you crazy? What does it mean to talk as a Jew? You're not religious. You are just choked by a rabbi. It's nothing. And you eat gefilte fish. It's not a lot. <laughs> Rather than talk as a Jew, come to Israel and be a Jew. We'll give you a tank. We'll give you a gun. You go to kill Palestinians every few months. This is, this is how they interpret their Jewish identity. I don't say that this is the only interpretation. JVP also tell you, be with us and be a Jew, but they have nothing to offer, just term, deceitful terminology, deceitful. ISIS is the answer to identity politics. Rather than talking as a Muslim in France, that means nothing. It means that you cannot have a beard, you cannot, uh, your wife cannot have a burqa, you people spit on you in the street. You go to Syria and you are a Muslim. I don't say that this is the only interpretation of Islam, but it appeals to a lot of people. What is the future? This is where we are going. 
There is a strong reaction to this moronic form of identity politics that was introduced in our society in order to break and divide the working class. Why do we want to divide the working class? Two reasons. Jewish, Jewish people, Jewish ID politics is very wary of working class. They are afraid of working class because it is always the working class that turn against them. So they have good reason. And shockingly enough, the left also hate the working class. Why? Because the working class never followed the left. They're always right wing. This is the disaster that the never, that William Hart tries to understand. How is it possible that we, the communists, offer everything to this working class? We offer them revolution, to stop working, to go there. <laughs> and they, they, go with, they go with the Nazi party. How is it possible? And by the way, William Hart came with a solution. He said, you know what? I'll tell you what we do. We teach the working class. Because they are conservative, we blast them with a sex revolution. We teach them to love kids and God knows. This is what it is. It is devastating. It is devastating. It is now time to stand up against it. it we don't need a leader. I mean, I don't mind to be, I'm, I'm free tomorrow, but, but uh, <laughs> two o'clock, no, uh, not tomorrow, day after tomorrow, no. <laughs> um, we may need a leader, but I think that we can see that the resistance to this horrid politics is happening. Naturally, the Scots didn't need Gilad Atzmon to wipe out the labor. It was so much fun to watch. We have First Amendment. I think that every American and every Western person who is familiar with American society and American politics and American constitution knows that it was the First Amendment that made America into the most special place on this planet. And it is so great, it is so great that Michael Oren and JVP revealed themselves as the first enemies of the most valuable and uh, the biggest asset that we, we, you have in your culture. What can be greater than that? Usually, these, for, for quite a few years, this struggle was managed in a clandestine manner, behind the scene. You didn't know. I would come to a place. And they tell me, oh, uh, there was a problem. We cannot have it here, and we would have to move. Now there is a greater panic. They are shouting, stop, Gilad. <laughs> you know? A few years ago, I was with a friend in Denver. We were just about to go to, not in Denver, in Boulder. We were just about on our way to Boulder University. And Anna Balzer, do you know the name? Yeah. Yeah. She's a good activist, huh? Anna Balzer, a good Jewish activist, called the organizer of the event. I was in the room. This wasn't planned. And she said, you cannot do the event tonight with Gilad Atzman. She didn't publish it on her blog. She tried to influence an organizer. They, it didn't work. So they came with a with an open call to denounce me. They even managed to get a few Palestinians to do it. And it didn't work. It's an opportunity to see who is the enemy within. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. I think, as a Palestinian, I, I'm wondering whether we are addressing the right community, the, the right response. Because I'm well aware of the differences. And having lived in Jaffa and having lived with many Jews for years before 1948, the question really is, what do we do now? As far as Israel is concerned, the problem of a Jewish state 
is not going to change in the foreseeable future. Their concept that this is a Jewish state, if it comes, if it becomes like America, where religion is not dominant, then it has a possibility to become a Middle East state. But they won't do that. The Zionists won't allow that. Ipikri, you probably know Dr. Uh, uh, Gershon Baskin, which is the, the Israeli Palestinian uh, Research Institute, came up with an idea that the right of return of Palestinians can go back mm -hmm. to their part of Israel, and that the, the Jews who are living in the uh, Gaza or in the, in the occupied lands can stay, but each one gets a work permit, like a green card, to live and work there, but they can't vote. So the Palestinians in the Israel will not, therefore, by increasing their population, affect the possibility of a change in the nature of Israel not becoming a Jewish state. So the Palestinians living there can work, but cannot vote, but they will hold a Palestinian passport. The Jews living in Palestine will hold a Jewish passport, an Israeli passport, but they can work and live and so on. And the idea is that it becomes one state without borders and everybody can resume what was the situation between Arabs and Jews at the time I lived there mm -hmm. as being friendly and cooperative. What do you think of the possibility of such a project, and what wouldn't you say that the real people to influence the future of any solution in Palestine is not in Palestine, but is here. And it's not the American public, but the Jewish exactly. community that should influence the decision. Okay, it's a, it's a very, uh, very uh, thought-provoking uh, um, question. My view is uh, on this uh, solution is very similar to uh, Paul Arudi. He said, Paul Arudi, you said we have, uh, uh, we have to choose between one Jewish state or two Jewish states. <laughs> this is the practicality of this, of this solution. Um, in the end, in the really last few words of my uh, previous book, I actually suggest that I know I know how to solve the problem. I openly advise Mr. Netanyahu, who was the prime minister then, is the prime minister here, and he will be a prime minister for many years, I guess. What to do? All he has to do is to stand up tomorrow morning either in the Knesset or to call a, a press conference and say, assuming that he really understands it, my dear Israeli citizens, we, have, we are subject to an on, ongoing conflict for many years. It occurred to me last night, it is very simple, that we all fight on the same land. And I would like to use this opportunity to invite all Palestinians who belong to this land to come back to their homes. As you probably know, those who are interested in Palestine, that most Palestinian land are still free. The, the, the villages were wiped out. I'm not talking about the cities. I'm not talking about uh, Yaffa. The villages were wiped out but they didn't build cities on them. It is kind of land on, uh, um, a government owned land. Uh, it is run by all these kibbutzim. It's a very interesting subject. Now, how many Palestinians would come back? I don't know. Do you know a lot of American Palestinians? Will they come back? Will Ali Abu Nima go back to Lifta to ride on a donkey? <laughs> Up the hill? I don't see him doing it. OK? So if the Israelis were as clever as we expect them to do, to be, they would come up with such a solution 
Israel would remove itself from the conflict. Nobody would be able to come to Israel and say, what have you done? We want to solve it. Then Israel would lead a solution. It would, it would probably even manage to maintain its Jewishness. In the book, I'm saying that most uh, Zionists, right-wing Israel, would say, listen, this is the, the end of the, this is the embodiment, the fulfillment of the Zionist project. We wanted to have a land, and here we are, initiating peace and resolving the issue. This is the most uh, beautiful Jewish dream. Are they going to do it? We can wait. They'll call me tomorrow. If you see it tomorrow, then no, they're not going to do it. And why they will not do it? Because for Netanyahu to behave like a universalist, humanist, a person who driven or touched by empathy, Bill Cook writes a lot about empathy, he has first to de Jewify himself. <laughs> this is very important. Jewishness, I'm not talking about Judaism, and I'm not talking about Jews. I'm talking about Jewishness. Jewish ideology is not empathic. Jewish ideology, Jewishness, is different modes that facilitate chosenness, sense of exceptionalism. This is something that you have to understand. Zionism is driven by exceptionalism. You say, we come here, we've been here 2,000 years ago. To believe in it, you must believe that you are very special, that you can come after 2,000 years. The Jews in the movement also feel very special. They say, we, the Jews in the movement, we have a special position to say because we are Jews. You said something about the role of the Jews. It's very problematic. Two days ago, I was sitting, I had a, an event in New York, three days ago in New York with a big rabbi, very, very clever rabbi, Rabbi Jacob Shapiro. He said, I'm an American. I believe in Judaism. Why do you ask me about Israel? Why? Why don't you ask me about Ukraine? I have zero connection. I'm connected with God, with the Torah. What these people, and this is the proper Judaic approach to the crisis. But when a Jew, I'm taking an extreme case now, when a good Jew like Max Blumenthal say, I believe in the right of return as a Jew. I said, wow, 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 stop. What do you mean you believe as a Jew in the right of return? Can I, as a kind of, I speak English more, more or less now, uh, do I come to your country and tell you what uh, to do, what to do with the Native Americans, or you, will you take it from me? No. When a Jew tells you, that he opposes Israel as a Jew, he actually confirms that Israel is the Jewish state and he has more rights than you to deal with it. It's a paradox. This is called paradox. This is the difference between Athens and Jerusalem. Aristo wouldn't come with such an idiotic statement. But the Jew can. And why? Because we are too scared to confront them. When Blumenthal, Miko Pellet is obviously in a different position, he's kind of Israel. When Philip Weiss or Blumenthal saying, as Jews, we uh, 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 something about Israel, they actually confirm their unique state. And if they're allowed to say something about Israel because they are Jews, then every Jew is entitled for an, an opinion on Israel. And as we know, the vast majority of the Jews support Israel. So it's not an argument. It doesn't serve the Palestinians. But there is one interesting aspect, twist. When Israel was winning the war, the wars, 
the Jews were very happy. 67, before 67, Zionism was kind of a slightly marginal crazy idea. After 67, the Jews became mega patriotic. Now, with the tunnels, with the Hamas being really forceful and, resen and, and resistance is something that Israel is not sure that it can handle, a lot of Jews moving away. Which means that the only answer to Israel is resistance. And if you ask me, when I became, when I realized myself that I'm in solidarity with the Palestinian people, with you guys, which is unusual, you know, I grew up in a very right wing, I felt guilty and I don't want to go into it. It was very clear to me that I have to support whatever the Palestinian, Palestinians do. So if a Palestinian put a bomb in a bus, I take the most radical case, and kill innocent Israelis, which is very, very problematic to support, I have to stand up there and to say, he did it because of you. Look what you have done. Look where you brought this man. Look where you brought this uh, young Ahmed from uh, Rafa. This is my role. This is the only mean of, meaning of solidarity. What does it mean to be in solidarity? To be with solidarity with yourself? This is what we are doing. Lacan, my favorite French psychoanalyst, said that the act of lovemaking is basically making love to yourself on the expense of the other. <laughs> Which is true. This is why I, long time ago, I tried once to do it alone, and it was almost as good. I, I, sometimes I do it with other people just, just, just to meet people, you know. <laughs> solidarity, Palestinian solidarity, is exactly that. We make love with ourselves on the expense of the Palestinians. This is the Jewish solidarity. This is what it is, and uh, no kids in the room. It's a form of masturbation. And as I said, masturbation is, is good, but it's not something that we do in public. <laughs> <laughs> you can get arrested. And JPP do, and Blue Metal is doing. <laughs> Are you ready? Uh, um, no, I don't want to, to, to exhaust you. Um, may, any more questions? Munir, you, 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 you already answered it. Why, why aren't they doing it? You already answered it. Uh, this, is, this is, you know, I didn't answer it. I want to say one thing. I'm saying what I, what I say is quite problematic. But there is one thing that I want you to understand. I don't think that this, that this Jewish organization or Jewish activists that are engaged in that act, not all Jews are engaged in that act. In fact, quite a few Jews are actually support what I'm doing in exposing it because they feel even more guilty about it, okay? But the Jews who are engaged in subverting the discourse and the, they don't necessarily do it consciously and because they are very bad people. There is a tribal impetus that drive this culture, that driven into this kind of exceptionalist discourse. Oh, yes, the Jews, we have a special role in the movement. <laughs> and they believe in it in this kind of world. We are so great, we are so we are righteous. It's great. It's called self-love. Jewishness is a unique blindness driven by self-love. And it's very hard to interfere with it. And by the way, we owe it to them. I'm not criticizing them. I'm trying to save them from themselves. Because it is very clear that my take on this issue is becoming more and more popular. It is becoming more and more popular. 
And this can lead, if they don't wake up now, it would lead into a tsunami of resentment, even within this movement. Three days ago, I was with this rabbi in New York. We were dealing, he's one of the most clever pe pe people I've ever come across. A major Orthodox rabbi sitting with Gila Datsmon in a theater. Gila Datsmon is supposed to be the anti-Semite. And I'm not an anti-Semite. I ate everyone equally. <laughs> <laughs> I myself contacted Philip Wise, Rebecca Will Will uh, Will. I don't know the, yeah. yeah, from the Secretary of JVP, Adam. All I, all Mondo Wise, uh, the edit, Mondo Wise editorial. Each of them, JVP. I know that a few other people wrote to them. We told them, listen, this is a very important exchange. This is very important. It's very important for you. It's all about your identity. There is an awakening around us. Please send your people. Please send someone to review it. They didn't answer. Fine. Yesterday, you know who reviewed it? The ADL. The ADL, the most horrible Zionist organization, was brave enough to come to this meeting. And they produced an incredibly genuine, honest, they produced a, a report of, of, this, of, this, of this event. Accurate. They accurate, totally. They presented my views, my disagreement with the rabbi, my agreement with the rabbi. It was incredible. But this explains why Zionism is such a powerful movement and why Jewish left is a control opposition apparatus. And I came to the conclusion the Jewish left is not the solution. It is actually the core of the problem. Um, Jordan. All right, since you made a lot of trouble for me, <laughs> I'm going to try to make a little bit for you. It's only fair, right? It's absolutely fair. All right. But you understand that as an Israeli, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily going to behave myself. <laughs> no, 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 no. All right, I understand that. Um, you know, that there are a lot of Jewish people around the world, including in the United States, who are not involved with Israel. They're not really involved in Jewish <laughs> politics. Yeah. They're nominally Jewish. Okay, with, with that being said, you, you commented on a, on a JVP website the following. You said, I argue that if Jewish history is proven to be a chain of Holocaust, and it is, Jews must try to grasp what it is in them that brings so many disasters upon themselves. Yeah. Now, if you think about that, you're basically saying that Jewish being, you know, innately there's a problem. In, like, if you were to say by African Americans, what is it in them that caused slavery? Or, about Palestinians, what is it in Palestinians that brought about the Nakba? You know, you couldn't do that, right? So, what, what are you saying with this comment? Let me, it's a, it's a great question. And I actually answered, somebody asked me the, exactly the same question. This morning. And, and I, and I, uh, somebody asked yesterday or two days ago, and I answered. You see, when I don't have answer, I always ready with the saxophone to, to, to offer to play a tune, <laughs> you know? <laughs> To start with, I choose my words very carefully. I say something very simple. If Jewish history is a chain of Holocaust, and it is, Jews must ask themselves why. Did I say that it's in their blood? Did they say that it's in the race? They're not a race. How could it be in the race? But you did say it. what it is in them. What did it? Exactly. What about the religion, the ideology, the identity politics, chosenness? I show that there is no real difference between 
JVP and Zionism from a perspective of chosenness. Chaim Weizmann, at the same time Bernard Lazar asked this question about what is it in Jews? He was a Zionist. And he came with a, it's a very important book. Check out Bernard Lazar. You can get it for free on the net. Fascinating. He asked, what is it in us? And he said, it's the supremacy. The supremacy is a culture, uh, cultural element. <coughs> now, why I don't accept the equivalence or the attempt to equate it with the Palestinians? Because the Palestinian history is not a chain of holocausts. Palestinians were living under occupation since the beginning of time, the beginning of their history. They had 70, uh, 70 different rulers in the last 2,000 years. And they coped. Geographical Yeah. Geographical they were in the region. So the Palestine, so they had one disaster, by the way, with the Jews. This is the Nakba. And, and the, you, you cannot compare it with the Jews, with all the Inquisition, the Shoah, the Chmelnitsky, the Chmelnitsky, you know, every 30 years, you know, we have a Coca-Cola cost. Sorry, the Coca-Cola cost is the next one. <laughs> all right? So this is not fair. You want to talk about black and slavery? Few people, few black intellectuals, and I work a lot with uh, different uh, uh, black institutions, and this question came up, and I say, and I tell black people, by the way, Malcolm X did the same. We have to look into ourselves. We have to look. This is part of the solution. Rather than, oh, Jews help us in the civil rights movements, you can say, we have to change our economy. What I'm telling the Palestinians, if you wait, for the Jews to liberate you from the Jews, you will wait for a long time. <laughs> a friend of mine was on his way to Gaza two weeks ago. He's a great guy. He's an ex-American, not a Jew. He's an ex-American military who 20 years ago realized that something is wrong. He's been in Gaza many times. He's a friend of Palestine. He got a clear instruction from Gaza. Don't come. We don't want any Westerners here. We had enough. And why? Because, yeah, no, it's fine. Because they realize that it's their battle. And they, and they will win. And they're winning. Israel will think twice before it sends its Golani to Sajaya next time. Now, you raised another question, Jews. I, in this talk, spoke about Jewish left. In my book, The Deal with Jewish Identity Politics, I make a clear distinction between Jews who identify with Judaism, which is innocent, Jews who are Jews because they have Jewish ancestry, identify as Jews because innocent, and Jews or identify politically. Jews who identify politically as Jews are never innocent. Whether they support the most beautiful ideas, they are not innocent. And why? Because Munir cannot join. And why? Because he's not racially qualified. Every form of Jewish politics, whether it is ADL or JVP, is racially oriented. And this is a problem. How can you be anti-racist if you are operating in Jews only political cell? What a joke! And we don't say it because it's offensive to the Jews and after the Holocaust. We... Enough! Enough! How many years are we going to be captured intellectually, ethically, mentally by this disaster that happened 70 years ago? Enough! Enough. Our job is not to prevent the Holocaust that happened 70 years ago, but to prevent the Holocaust that are created in the name of the Holocaust on a daily basis. <laughs> Did I address your, your question, brother? Pretty good. 
<laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> You know, in, in terms of uh, social mobilization, you had mentioned how perhaps ineffective the protest uh, movements are, but couldn't we see this also as a, as a process, as a, a means by which we create public awareness? And, and does it have its own value uh, in that regard? I'm, so, think, I'm thinking of the, uh, for instance, I was at Berkeley during the anti-war in, in the late 60s. Yeah. And that was a major, major event that created the national, basically, visualization of what was going on. And whether it changed anything, at least it created an amount of awareness where people wanted to know more about it. And do, doesn't, isn't that the value of public protests? In order to okay, create? I understand the... Yeah. I think that we went through a very, I'm not sure that if, I, uh, if we were uh, in this room in 1962 or let's say 68, uh, the peak 69, the peak of the Vietnam War, I would talk, I would come with the same ideas. Okay. Internet, yeah. blogs. Yes. We are bigger, if you have 20, friends of Twitter, you're bigger than The Guardian. Yes. I'm not writing a lot now because I'm upset by my own writing. It's quite a unique uh, concept. You know, <laughs> my writing is so upsetting that I'm, uh, I, I get, uh, yeah, no, but when I write, I see my stuff read by millions of people because they don't write for The Guardian. When I wrote for The Guardian like 10 years ago now, 2005, I just couldn't believe the lameness. I called him The Guardian of Zion and The Observer of Judea. I was writing about jazz and I wasn't free. Okay, they paid me a lot, by the way. They paid well, but now it's gone. We are free. This is something unique. We have counterpunch, we have information clearing house, we have dissident voice, we have Twitter. I realize when you buy the book, start to tweet them and, pay and face the consequences. <laughs> Water is vital for all non forms of life except Palestinians. <laughs> you know, this is a kind of a Twitter ratty concept. This is where, where we are going. I, I'm a jazz artist. I'm a famous jazz musician. I never wanted to be a writer. I started after 9-11, 9-11 by the way in the book, a nice German car. This is the Israeli perception, you know. After, after the, after, after 9-11, I started, because I was trained as a philosopher, I studied philosophy, I started to write. <coughs> and within two weeks, I was kind of prime on counterpunch. I didn't know, I don't even know how they got it. You know? And I started to write more and more, and I, I was all over the place. And then I started to get, I, I, became, I, just start, I, I was subject to a lot of harassment. So I realized that I must do something right. So I started to write more, and more, you know, that's the way it is now. I don't say write, talk, write, sing, speak in the phone, do whatever you like. Just don't <coughs> wait from the master, you know, in the 60s when we went to university, I went in the 80s, but we spoke about, spoke about master of discourse. We don't have master of discourse. Today I'm kind of open, I opened my eyes, I saw that there is a war in London. And I see all the idiotic interpretations coming for, uh, through Facebook. Oh, we have to, we have communism, what communism, what are you talking about? You know, you know and, and you can choose. It's a very different, um, different, situation. Uh, very, we are evolving into something, maybe we don't understand the, the, the condition in which we live in, but it is definitely fascinating and we have to be quick 
and resilience is needed because we are going down. Last one. Yeah, we speak a lot about Palestinians. I'm wondering, what is the likelihood, what are the, what are the chances that Israelis will liberate themselves from the state of Israel? That the Israelis will liberate themselves? Themselves from the state, yeah. yeah. Let me tell you something interesting. As I mentioned, JVP didn't have the balls to confront my criticism. ADL had. There is something slightly more, I'm going to annoy you now. Maybe it's not good for selling. There is something slightly healthier in Israel than its opponent. As I mentioned, in Israel, the third part, biggest party is Arab party. So the Knesset is more diverse than the progressive Jews. There is a reason why the most significant thinkers on the problems are, maybe you don't agree with me, are people like Shlomo Zand, Israel Shachak, Israel Shamir, some people count myself with the wandering go in. I mean, why? We are all Israelis. Because in Israel, we had this promise to turn us into civilized human beings. The whole idea of Zionism was to turn the Jews into civilized human beings. Zionism is in itself originally an anti-Semitic movement. No, 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 this is not a joke. You have to understand that this is the case. If you read what Herzl and Jabotinsky and Nordau write about the Jews, you think oh, it must be Hitler. It's not. They hated the Jew. The promise to bring to the world a nice Jew. Uri Avneri, whether you like him or not, is driven by this belief that the Jew could be a beautiful human being. And he fights for it all his life. He's now 75, 80? 90. Yeah? Um, Gideon Levy, the same thing. I don't have any problem. When I read, sometimes I don't agree with Uri. But I enjoy reading him. I don't feel that he's lying to me. When I read Jeff Alper, the lefty American Jew who lives in Palestine, and tell not to destroy Palestinian houses. So if you are American Jew come to live in Palestine, how are we supposed to defend you? What a level of law, deceit? The big difference between an Israeli who was born there, who is locked into the situation. And I cannot predict, but there is still strong element within Israeli society of people who oppose it. I think that they are very, very small. That's it. What I'm going to do now. Because, because, uh, because I'm a saxophonist, um, I just before uh, before we can now we will stop and uh, we'll have drink and you can still talk to me and ideally you empty my stock because it's very expensive to fly it out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, and then it, it is it is I promise it is basically a toilet book, yeah, <laughs> because I realize that we have to bring the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to where it belongs, the restroom. <laughs> I will play, I'm going to play to you uh, just on my own. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to blast you with volume, be careful, yeah? Okay. Yeah, with the, uh, a tune, I didn't check out. The, I'm going to play to you a tune that was uh, sung for many years by my uh, favorite uh, Palestinian <coughs> trumpeter, Louis Armstrong. <laughs> uh, because I believe that uh, Like Louis Armstrong, that in spite of uh, Tsipi Livni and Benjamin Netanyahu and people like Bush, some would say Obama, but actually I'm quite delighted with the way Obama is going now, and Blair and Hollande. It's quite a long list, and uh, you can mention even me if you don't like me. 
in spite of all these horrible people, it's down to us to make it into a wonderful world. <laughs> saxophonist I've ever played with. He was a young kid who was apparently Palestinian. Uh, in, I was really looking forward to come here and to play with him. Again, he was very, very young. I think he was 32. Zen. His name was uh, Zen Musa. And it is a, a, a huge loss for his family, but it is huge loss for the world of music, and this tune was for him. Thank you. Thank you. 